Thank you, Dallas. Can everybody hear me? It's all good? Great. Yeah, as Dallas said, um, Snapper is something that's very close to my heart and I've spent a lot of time working on them over the years and trying to understand what makes them tick and what makes this fishery tick and what makes this fishery such a great fishery and so resilient. Um, and hopefully tonight I'm going to give you a bit of insight into some of those learnings and, as Dallas said, why our fishery tends to perform consistently well um, when other fisheries are having issues. Um, so I'm going to start off talking about an amazing natural phenomena that is pretty unique to Port Phillip Bay and that is this migration of large snapper into Port Phillip Bay. Every year during the spring these masses of snapper are coming in from the coast and um, I kind of sometimes think that this is worthy of a story in you know, National Geographic or something like that. It's a, it's a remarkable phenomena and not many people know about it or realise it. You guys do because you, you plan your fishing season around it. But the general Melburnians or people of Victoria don't realise that thousands and thousands, probably several thousand tonnes of snapper are finding their way from along the coast somehow getting their way through that little tiny narrow entrance into Port Phillip Bay and coming up into places like Carambite and Hobson's Bay for the primary reason of reproduction. Snappers form these aggregations when they come into the bay and here's an example of a snapper aggregation. It's a, it's a little bit rough because it's a GoPro dropped from a boat. You can see them circling around in a big school. Um, these fish are actually doing what's called broadcast spawning. So they form these schools and it's like a little kind of a, you know, a fish orgy or something, you know, like they all just, <laughs> they all just get together and they're pumping out eggs and sperm into the water column, which are just passively fertilizing. Um, and hopefully if they do get fertilized and hatch, they turn into little baby snapper larvae. And, um, each uh, female snapper could probably release up to 800,000 eggs in an individual spawning event. And snapper are what's called broad serial spawners. So each snapper will spawn many times over a season. So they'll, they'll school up, form aggregations. And these are probably like, you know, you see those big Christmas tree marks on your sanders sometimes. And they're often part, you, you chuck your bait and you don't catch any. They're not really feeding because they're doing this. They're not interested in the food. Um, They'll spawn, they'll break up and then they'll disperse again and then they'll find another little orgy to join into and do it all again. So um, it's a pretty good time for them, but they work very hard to, to get into the bay. You know, imagine the amount of energy they spend finding their way into the bay. So coming into the bay, spawning, feeding, spawning, feeding. Um, most of the eggs and larvae actually die. That's, that's the strategy of these fish. They're laying thousands and thousands of eggs. Um, there's no parental care. They don't really care what happens to their babies. They just let them go. But most of them die. But because there's so many of them spawned, a small amount of survival leads to a lot of baby fish. Those ones that do survive find themselves in an amazing place to grow up as a baby snapper. Port Phillip Bay is a perfect nursery area for fish. Sheltered waters, not big tidal currents for them to have to continually swim against. We have this little river up here called the Yarra, which is absolutely critical to the fisheries of our bay. It pumps nutrients down and they run along the coast here into Carambite. And there's actually an eddy current in Carambite that collects all these nutrients. This is like the fertiliser of the bay. And that supports the food chain, these microscopic little planktonic crustaceans. These little guys are what the tiny snapper larvae need to eat. And when these little guys hatch out of their eggs, they don't have any body reserves, they don't have any sort of fat or anything to live off. Once they can start eating, once their mouth gets big enough, they have to find these prey and eat them. And if they don't find these prey, then they will starve and just waste away and die very quickly. So the abundance of these prey is very critical to the how many of these survive each year, which then in turn means how many little babies we get. So these guys settle to the bottom after about 20 days, 
drifting around in the water column. And when they get on the bay, the sandy, muddy bottoms of the bay are perfect for them. There's heaps of little worms and crabs and shrimps and little tiny gobies and other fish that these little guys can feed on. Um, so yeah, Port Phillip Bay, you know, it really is a great place to spawn and that's why these um, snapper have probably queued into it as a, as a breeding area over thousands of years. While these snapper are migrating in, you guys are all migrating down to boat ramps as well to go fishing because it is, as Dallas said, it is the one of the big things on the fishing calendar of Victoria is the snapper season. And, um, you know, it gets a fair, fair bit of pressure. And you might wonder that, how's this all sustainable? A lot of boats out here, Karen Bite, this is a hot bite off Karen one day, I was out this day, Altona on a busy day. Um, but it's still going strong. And as I talked to you about the migration habits and things that we've learnt, you'll realise why. So. One of the things we need to ensure that this fishery does stay as healthy as and sustainable is we need information. We need to understand these migrations. We need to understand the spawning success, etc., and use that information in how we manage the fishery. So one of the things we did a few years ago with some money from your licence fees is do some studies on understanding these migration behaviours. And, you know, we can't, we can't watch these things like, you know, wildebeest on the Serengeti or anything. We have to use techniques to, to track their movements. And um, technology's helped a lot. We now have little electronic ultrasonic transmitter tags that we can actually surgically implant inside the stomach cavities of snapper. So we catch the snapper and anaesthetise it, do a little, little bit of surgery, put the tag inside, stitch it back up, recover the fish and release it, and these tags actually transmit unique ultrasonic signals and each signal is unique for that tag and, and what happens then is we deploy these uh, what's called listening stations throughout the bay and if it fish with one of these transmitters inside its guts, swims within 400 metres of one of these transmitters, it will detect the signal from the tag and it will record the time and date and the unique ID of that fish so we can work out which fish was where when. So all these red dots are these listening stations that we deployed. And um, importantly, we deployed a curtain across the entrance to the bay here, which had overlapping detection. So we could track fish moving in and out. You can see we had a lot of focus up here in the Carabite Hobson's Bay, the main spawning ground. All those black areas are where we actually tag fish. I'll just quickly run through some of the key results. This is the patterns of movements in and out of the heads, which is really relevant to this time of the year. So fish started turning up as early as the first week of September, the, the fish we tagged. Uh, the first week of September we started getting a few turning up, but by far the bulk of the migrants come in through October, so this is now, um, and a dribble through in November, and we still had a few late arrivals into December. So. October is the main month, so the fish are probably still coming in now and that's why in November it's probably the best fishing time because all those migrants are up in the bay already. About 12 and a half degrees was when the first ones turned up and they make a beeline for Karen Bite. They don't hang around at all down in here. They're straight up here. That We usually pick them up here around off the Mornington Wide, Mornington Hospital, those sort of marks here and then they're straight up in the Karen Bight. And 13 to 19 degrees is generally the period of time that they spend up here, but the peak of detection is around 15 to 19. So I think I was talking to I think it was David before, the water temperature is around 15, 16 at the moment. Um, so we should be getting to the point where the fish are mostly up in here now, and if they're not feeding, they probably will soon as the water starts to kick up a little bit more. Um, what we found in terms of when the fish leave is that, quite remarkably, they start leaving in December. And usually around Christmas Day, um, late, you know, late December, we start to see these fish moving out of this area. They, they tend to come back down here again off, off Mornington. 
and then out the bay through various channels. A lot of the movement's through the south channel, but they do go through all the main channels. So we get this first wave of, of movement out of the bay. Then we get a second lot, but it's later in autumn, early winter, there's these sort of two groups of migration. And once the temperature hits 19 here, pretty much it all shuts down in Carambite. The fish are going. The ones that remain when the water temperatures get above 19, we detect them a lot further south and out deeper. So if you're looking for fish out Have a, have a little go out there by then. And the key thing about this temperature range is that we did a lot of work around looking at climate change impacts on snapper. You know, everyone's interested in, in what warming water temperatures are going to do for key fish species. And fish are getting up here, getting most of their spawning done by about 19 because the temperature really shoots up rapidly after Christmas and can get up into that warm range when it's not suitable for the eggs. So they've adapted, they've timed these migrations to be up in here when the temperature is just right for their eggs. And it also corresponds with the spring plankton bloom when there's all them zooplankton and, and food for their larvae. Now I'm just going to show you some of the individual movements. So these are tracks of individual fish, just a couple to give you a, a pretty interesting insight into the remarkable navigational behaviours of these fish. And you'll know why he's called Lucky Phil shortly. Um, this was a fish we tagged uh, middle, middle of um, December and he departed on Christmas Eve. So we didn't get much of the first year. The second year, he turned up on the 20th of October through the heads, went straight up to the barge. You know, everyone knows the barge off Carrum, 18 metres barge, one of the most popular snapper marks in the bay. This was his kind of home, but he never spent long there. He was toing and froing out to some of these artificial reefs that we put in a few years ago, Tedesco, Yakka Reef. He used all of those off to Faulkner Beacon. And this was typical of a lot of these fish. They never really stay long in the one place. They use the structures a fair bit. They use the mud as, just as much, but they never stay put. They move around, and he left on the 18th to the 12th. So he was one of these fish that only stayed a couple of months. The next year, he turned up the 21st of the 10th, one day different to the year before. He went straight up to the barge again. And we didn't get as many detections, but he pretty much did the same thing, uh, in and out of the barge area to the same sort of marks. And our last detection of this fish was here at the Faulkner Beacon on the 14th of the 11th. And guess where he was the year before at the same time, pretty much 22nd of the 11th, Faulkner Beacon. So this fish has got the same sort of behaviour year after year. He sort of cued into something that worked for him and he stuck to it. I'll just show you one more, um, which is one of these long-staying fish. It's tagged in April, left in late April. The next year turned up 27th of the 10th. They all come in at the same time. He went up to Mornington Paddock Mark and he sort of moved around Carambide up into Hobson's Bay and he left again on the 16th of the 4th, so like the uh, 22nd of the 4th the year before he left. 171 days this fish stayed in. The next year, he turns up 24th of the 10th, three days difference to the year before. Like, how do they do it? They're coming from maybe hundreds of kilometres away on the coast and finding their time, you know, getting back at the same time. And remarkably, pretty much the same sort of movement patterns. And like Lucky Phil... Um,
Um, so going on to the information, one of the things that's really important to know when you're managing a fishery is, particularly in Port Phillip Bay or Western Port, it's a small area. How does it relate to snapper? Snapper are distributed from Southern Great Barrier Reef all around way to Shark Bay in, in um, Western Australia. But they're composed of stocks or units that breed within each other. Port Phillip Bay is part of what's called the Western Victorian stock. And although it's sort of spread up into South Australia, we've claimed it. It's, it's ours, right? Western Victorian stock, right? They, they want some of that now, but it's ours. We've called it the Western Victorian stock, but it runs all the way up to Kangaroo Island. And using genetics and various other techniques, we've worked out that most of the replenishment of this whole stock over a 1,000 kilometres is derived from these spawning aggregations in Port Phillip Bay. You can see there's no other sheltered bays really along the coast. There's a little bit in Western Port, but by far the bulk of the replenishment comes out of Port Phillip. So Port Phillip really underpins the dynamics of this stock. So although um, like one of the key things about the resilience of this fishery is that it's migratory. These fish, most of these fish are only in the bay for a couple of months of the year. And when they're out on the coast, they're not subject to much fishing pressure at all. And that's a saving grace for them. What's going on in South Australia is these are the South Australian stocks, particularly in the Gulfs. A lot of these fish are resident. They never leave. And so even though they have closed seasons and different regulations on them, when those seasons open up again, the fish just stay there and they continue getting fished. So they're a lot more vulnerable to fishing pressure than our stock. But we rely on this spawning in Port Phillip Bay and its success, and it's highly uncertain, as I'll show you. It doesn't work from year to year. So um, while this migration is really, really strong benefit for us in terms of our fishery, spawning success is really variable, and that's one of the key things that drives our fishery and that we have to be aware of when we manage it. So as I get to, towards the end of my talk, one of the key things we do is every year we go out a few months after the spawning's finished, so in March, April, and we survey these little baby fish to, to work out how many babies are produced from each spawning, which gives us a window into the future of the fishery. I'll just show you a short video just to show you how we do it. Uh, we've headed out tonight as part of our surveys of a range of sites in Port Villa Bay. Um, these sites cover the main nursery areas for snapper in central and western Victoria. What we find from these surveys tell us about replenishment of snapper populations all the way from Portland to Wilson's Promontory, including Port Phillip Bay and Western Port Bay. We come out at night to survey, as this is when the juvenile snapper are more effectively caught by our small trawl net. Over the last 23 years, fisheries scientists have built up an invaluable database that's allowed us to track long-term variation in the abundance of baby snapper, and has also shown us how variable the numbers are from year to year. Linking this data with other information gives us an understanding of what natural factors might be influencing them. I'll leave it there because um, I'm going to tell you what we found. This graph here is going to get a little bit sciencey, just warning you. Um, this is 27 years of spawning success of snapper in Port Phillip Bay. Um, and you can see how variable it is from year to year. Um, we've had some really good times in the last 15 or so years, and these have driven the recovery of our fishery. And it's why it's been pretty consistent, really good. But we've also had a lot of bad years. So this is all just due to nature. It's, it's about how many of those little zooplankton are out there in the water column when those larvae hatch out. That's where it all stems from, the first few weeks of life of these fish. So nature has a big part to play in what our fishery does. So long as we get these big years every now and then, our fishery will continue to kick over. And that's why this monitoring is really important. Um, see this year here, 2018? Two years ago, the largest recruitment of snapper we've had in 27 years. Um, 
You would have seen these little ones out there, I imagine, you're fishing for whiting and that. They're, they're everywhere at the moment. They are the future, the future of this fishery. That's, that's what you're going to be fishing in a few years' time. Um, but, sorry, this graph here doesn't, it's because it's, it's babies and it's annual, it doesn't quite tell us what it means for the adult fishery because year classes build on top of each other and they're also dying naturally as they grow into the fishery. So what we're able to do is work out the age of the fish by using the ear bones. So we cut the ear bone out, the ear stone, we put a slice, put it under the microscope and we count these rings like tree trunks. That's how we age the fish. This is the growth curve typical of a snapper. So a, a size limit fish is usually about four years old and a 40 centimetre slot fish is about seven six or seven. So we know it takes six years for these fish to get to that 40 centimetre limit. So what we can do, just using a little bit of pretty simple mathematics to account for the accumulation and the mortality, we can create this, this index from this one. And this is an index of a predictive index of the adult fishery. And you can see how these peaks in the babies line up with these predicted peaks in the adult fishery. Um, so we've now got this capacity to forecast the fishery with a six-year lead time. Um, do we believe it, though? That's the thing. That's just a survey. What does it actually mean? Do we have any other information to validate it? Well, we do because we also run these krill surveys where we go to boat ramps and we question you guys about your catches. Some of you might have been surveyed before. And we've been doing that since the, the late 80s. And that gives us an indication of the catch rate of big fish which is telling us about the abundance of large fish in the stock. That's what that survey data tells us. We had a few periods where we stopped doing it, but this is the 90s. This is when the fishery was pretty much on its knees. This was kind of South Australia back then, I suppose. Um, we had really poor recruitment for a lot of years, and the fishery was quite low, but it's recovered to the point where in the mid, in 2010, 11, 12, probably the best fishing we've had in 30, 40 or more years in this snapper fishery. Fish have died naturally and been caught, and this is where we are now. Let's overlay that blue graph, which was the, the prediction graph. It's not, a it's not a bad predictor of that orange graph, is it? So we're pretty confident we can use those baby survey data to predict the catch rates that you guys are going to get when you go fishing. And with that, we can then forecast. So this black line is the future of your fishery. I'll get rid of the blue line now just because that confuses things. So this is what we're looking at over the next five or six years. And if we benchmark that against, say, something a good year back in the mid-2000s, and we want to stay above that, the future is looking pretty good. You know, we've got a pretty good outlook for this fishery. This is where we are now, so expecting pretty similar sort of fishing to the last year or so. I reckon it might get a little bit better over the next year or so before we get this massive pulse of fish coming in 2024, 2025. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but I just want to quickly touch on Western Port. Western Port's a slightly different fishery. Um, what we have in Western Port is most of the fish in Western Port that we survey, and this is 3,000 measurements, are smaller, about three to six years of age. There's still big fish there, but the bulk of the fish are these smaller pinky sizes, whereas in Port Phillip, it's more your bigger spawners that are coming in to do the spawning. So if we do the same analysis, this is the, the boat ramp survey data, but we use the blue line, but we only base it on three to six year old fish. It tends to match up a little bit better with Western Port and it shows this sort of decline in Western Port that people have been talking about, that we've had you know, not as good fishing in there over the last few years, but what we expect is that that's going to improve um, as these other fish, because they move around into Western Port and it will improve over the next few years. So just quickly to sum up, great, we can predict what's going on in the fishery. That's awesome for the managers. It's awesome for, to work with you guys to plan ahead if we think that things are going to go bad. Expect a lot of undersized fish. So it's up to, up to you guys to be stewards of these fish and look after them, handle them, get them back in the water quickly. 
I've probably touched on those things in terms of the future, the increases we're going to see. And overall, we, we're pretty happy that this stock is in a pretty sustainable situation. Just to finish up on information, we always need more information to help. And what we're doing, we've, we've traditionally had diary anglers who fill out paper diaries. We're now in the phase of rolling out a, a phone app where people can actually record their fishing details on their phone app and that data will come to us and we'll be able to use that in our assessment. So keep an eye out for this because it's going to be launched pretty soon, isn't it, Dallas? Um, and it'll be advertised through our Facebook and social media and on, on our website. So keep an eye out for that phone app. And if you're interested in contributing, um, it's a great way for you to help us out. So with that, I'll say thank you for listening and thank you to all the people that have helped me over the years.